humans, Lascavarians, Cree, cybernetic raccoons, giant talking trees, and smoking hot rajack chicks to the Bizzlecast. This is the Bizzle, and this is the Bizzle's commentary on Guardians of the fucking Galaxy. I can't believe this movie got made and made almost $800 billion. It is amazing, and while I do have some critiques of it, it's mostly just from an aesthetic standpoint. The heart behind this movie is so incredible. It's really funny in a way that's marvel but not Whedon-esque. Great change of pace in terms of both comedy and drama. It's beautiful to look at, even when I might have made some minor different choices. But the character stuff in this movie is what makes it go. This is one of the best Marvel movies ever, one of the best sci-fi space operas ever, and since Star Wars is coming out very shortly, the new Star Wars, Episode 7, I'm going to be releasing, in some order, my favorite space operas uh, since the original Star Wars, which includes this movie, of course, along with the Star Trek reboot, which I released a while ago, but I'm going to re-release as part of my Star Wars lead-up, and the Serenity movie by Joss Whedon, which capped off the Firefly television series. There's so much to talk about with this movie. I get a lot in during the commentary, but this became a cult classic, and even people like myself who, you know, was into Marvel Comics growing up, but even people who are nerdier than me didn't know about this property or had heard of it and knew nothing about it. I still don't know the full story of why and how this one got made in particular, but James Gunn, who had directed some, you know, small cult sci-fi horror stuff before, they tabbed him for this, they gave him a huge budget, a ton of creative space and leeway, And Marvel admitted they didn't know what the hell was going to happen with this movie. But to outgross both the Captain America and X-Men movies in 2014, both domestically and foreign, combined, is really ridiculous. And a lot of it has to do, obviously, with the direction and writing, but especially the cast. Chris Pratt, who is Andy Dwyer on Parks and Rec, uh, one of the fastest rises to fame, especially if you consider his role in Jurassic World more recently in 2015, which is now the third highest grossing movie ever. I don't know how that happened, but, you know, it was one of those it, that made total sense when I heard the casting, even though he hadn't done any big films before, let alone be a lead of, of a massive comic book space opera movie. For me, Zoe Saldana is what makes it go, even though the writing for her early is a little so-so and a little flat, but that is intentional, just as it is with Drax, played by the wrestler-turned-actor Dave Bautista. You know, there's sort of a a comedic misdirect where you have these really flat characters early on, and they turn out to be absolutely hysterical and multidimensional. Obviously, Bradley Cooper as the voice of Rocket, one of the great voice performances ever. Vin Diesel somehow making I Am Groot sound interesting over and over again. Just fantastic cabios by Glenn Close and especially John C. Riley, who is absolutely hysterical and Benicio Del Toro as the space Liberace collector who's just a total creepazoid and has the best comic book exposition ever and while the final space battle leaves a little to be desired for me as a huge space nerd the real climax with the spinning purple uh, cloud sequence with the infinity stone taken on Ronan with the music and the image of his mom and the team coming together I really just go crazy during that part of the commentary the music in this movie is amazing both because of the soundtrack which is part of what hooked everyone to this movie is that it takes place in deep space But, you know, with a very emotional opening scene with young Peter Quill seeing his mom dying from cancer and the, uh, you know, cassette from 1988 that she gave him that he listened to over and over again, even when he's abducted, being the connection back to Earth. So, you know, you've got a a cosmic vision that's at least as crazy as the Star Wars one. And yet you've got, you know, David Bowie and Joan Jett. And, you know, the Jackson 5, it's absolutely brilliant. But even more crazy is that Tyler Bates, who did the score for the movie, the orchestral score, this is one of the best orchestral scores for an epic movie ever, maybe the best Marvel score, and he had to do it within the bounds of a huge soundtrack that became the best-selling compilation soundtrack ever. But Tyler Bates' score, which you will hear me sing occasionally and talk about a lot, you know, for me, you know, brings it up to the next level emotionally. So I'm going to get right into it. So cue up your files or DVDs. 
I synced this movie with both Amazon Instant Video, Blu-ray, various digital files. It should all line up. Uh, I think this one's going to be okay. So go to zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. Pause if you need to take a minute to do that. And when you're ready, come back. I'm about to do the countdown. And just remember, when I say hit play, you should hit play with me. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, play. All right, people. Welcome to Guardians of the fucking Galaxy. Um, I cannot believe that this movie got greenlit. I cannot believe that it got made. But even more so, I cannot believe that it's made $750 million and has become a cult classic even among non-sci-fi people. I did the Serenity commentary recently, the Joss Whedon movie that capped off the Firefly TV series he did. And I talked a lot about Guardians, even though they're very different. And for me, Serenity's slightly ahead. This movie is very, very smart, very, very funny, and has a ton of heart. It's one of my favorite Marvel movies. And, you know... But you have to have a hierarchy, and it's the Avengers and Winter Soldier at the tab, but this is the undisputed top of the second rank for me. And what hooked a lot of people was this first scene. Um, I I believe this was the first, and maybe still only, Marvel movie where they didn't show the Marvel comics, uh, you know, uh, quickly turning uh, CGI comic book page title card that they always have with the Marvel music. They went straight to Earth, and they said 1986, I believe. And, uh, you know, (laughs) these days we all have people that we know or in our family or both that have cancer or have had cancer or died of cancer, and people could relate to this. It's amazing what a little genuine human drama at the beginning can do. We never see this boy again, totally by him as a young Chris Pratt. And The Awesome Mix Volume 1, I mean, is the best-selling a soundtrack ever in terms of soundtracks that are compilations as opposed to original compositions. Um, I have to guess the Titanic is maybe the best. I could, I could be wrong, but that is an educated guess. However, the music is great. James Gunn, who directed and wrote the movie, does a brilliant job. He picked out the songs himself from like, a, I think he said a thousand. Um, but even if it was 100 or 150, I mean, that's a really difficult task for your first big epic movie. And, you know, the I Got a Feeling song or whatever, it was in all the trailers and it got you, it was exciting. It's danceable. It felt like a party. And this movie, after this really sad first scene and some touching stuff at the end where it, it's coming full circle and he's revisiting this much later in life in deep space. His mom dies, he's crying, he couldn't touch her. Now he touches her after she's dead. Oh, man. And, and this this scene could so easily go wrong, but they nailed the actors. Great child actor. I'm always complaining. There's got to be more child actors out there that, that aren't, you know, young Anakin Skywalker, this kid. Look at him. And you could end the scene here. You could totally end the scene here. But nope, they're going to show what happened. This is great. You had to bridge to the sci-fi with this kid. Had to do it. You got the mist covered, you know, uh, woods or open fields. Typical environment for <laughs> getting abducted by aliens. He's crying over his mom. I- I'm not, you know, trying to <laughs> minimize her death, which was very sad, but there's a type of humor here, and this movie has a ton of humor. This looks great. Totally fantasy. Thor, I'm down. Now, here come the Marvel um, title cards. This is a brilliant idea. I mean, it's so obvious to do this, but the way they execute the 3D blocks with you know, actual images from the Marvel comics, ugh, as a nerd, this and the music gets me every time. But this movie is hilarious. Um, I think I probably found it slightly less hilarious than uh, you know other people who really, really are obsessed with this movie, and I totally dig that because I get obsessed with a lot of movies. But one of the themes, and, um, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to do a podcast. This looks beautiful. I love this whole scene. Amazing. The, the uh, title credit's so fabulous. The font is perfect. 
um, my, uh, my nerd friends, uh, I mean, they're not really my friends. I communicate with them online, listen to their podcasts. I've been doing, um, comic book, uh, genre related podcasts for many years now. Um, now they primarily do Marvel stuff just because Marvel's putting out 90%. I mean, if you include, you know, Fox and Sony with Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and X-Men, and this, I mean, that's almost all the comic book movies, at least for now. Um, this looks great. This device makes no sense. What, what historical event is just hovering in the air here? But it's a great concept. But the, the podcast commentary that the modern myth media did, they're the website and podcast series I'm talking about, which is hosted by a guy named Sean Gerber. Second in command is Paul Herman, and they have a bunch of other guests who rotate in and out. Great guys, really funny, really perceptive about these movies, know way more about the comics than I do, and watch everything, all the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Carter, etc., blah, blah, blah. They know so much about the comics, and they've caught up, even in areas they didn't read when they were kids. They've done what I have tried to do a little bit, but have failed, which is really catch up on, like, Thor or Hulk. You know, Hulk and Thor I never read when I was a kid. I just can't do it. I just love X-Men. If I'm really going to sit down and read a comic book, it's going to be X-Men. But they did a fantastic commentary of this movie that really echoed many of my own thoughts because I loved it too. I loved it, I think, the most on the second viewing, which is often the case with me. First viewing, I'm just trying to get a feel for it. But, you know, you get a feel for it, you know, six minutes in with this guy, Chris Pratt, Andy Dwyer from Parks and Rec, who has always killed me. I love this casting. Now he's a huge star. He was a star of Jurassic World, the Jurassic Park sequel, which is the like third highest grossing movie ever. Look at this. He he's in a creepy alien, you know, space artifacts, uh, you know, location with weird, gross aliens creatures. He's kicking them around. He's listening to the fucking soul music. Get the mic going. I mean, this the movie is it for how big it is. It's relatively flawless, and it's not the sort of pure minimalist perfection of the Star Trek reboot or Serenity, or even the Winter Soldier. It's more in line with the Avengers and just going for it, swinging for the moon. And if you connect on ninety five percent, which they basically do, you know, it's sort of like. You know, movies like The Winter Soldier, they're like Ichiro Suzuki. High average, almost never gets out, constantly on base, stealing bases, doing all sorts of stuff, playing outfield. You know, Guardians and the Avengers, they're like, you know, Albert Pujols in his prime, or Barry Bonds or A-Rod before they were taking steroids, and we knew they were taking steroids. They're sluggers, and they have their flaws, but man, do they win games for you by themselves at times. And, uh... You know, this movie got so many points for me for just embracing the crazy cosmic vision. And while the vision is very different in look, tone, feel, approach, filming, Star Wars, this is kind of a Star Wars shot here with the ships very quickly stopping above, uh, right above the planets. Goes for its own aesthetic. You know, it's not always consistent, but the colors are great. And the biggest strength, look at this, okay, I'm gonna get, I'll get back to the aesthetics and the strengths and weaknesses. The orb with the Infinity Stone. Okay, so first of all, this is the first Infinity Stone that we learn in the movie in which it's introduced is an Infinity Stone. In fact, this is the big exposition. That is, I believe, the power gem of the six Infinity Stones. But between that purple color which is so beautiful, I could look at forever. I love purple. I love dark, like dark, like black purple. Um, and the orb itself, which is so practical and three-dimensional and tactile, and the, and the runes on it. Um, it's perfect size and weight. Here we go. Star-Lord. <laughs> Jimon Hansi, bless his heart. I'm not sure he... Well, I don't know. At first, it feels like he's not comfortable, but he has some hilarious uh, looks at the movie. He, and, and he just has a great look. You know? To see him as a bad guy is, is interesting. He's, he plays such a good, complicated, passionate, good guy. 
really well. Boom. So, okay. <laughs> if I say I have, like, a problem with something or I seem to criticize it, it's not a criticism of, like, the execution or even the idea necessarily. It's just making comparisons. And what I love about, you know, Star Wars and Firefly slash Serenity and the way they portray Kirk and the reboots is just constantly fighting head to hand. Wow, look at that shot. Full slow mo, but doesn't look like the Matrix. I really respect that. Most of those sorts of, of uh intentional slow mo action shots look like the Matrix, which I'm fine with. But that was wholly original. This looks great. The practical ship. But the colors of that orb, and what we'll see later when the orb's power is manifested, is just spectacular. Look at that, boom. So I'm watching this on my computer. So, okay, right there, the head-on shot. And this isn't really a complaint. It's just the the ships look kind of shiny at times. The paint is just too bright. And I get that they were going for super colorful in this movie, and it's beautiful to watch. But, you know... <laughs> The amount of subtlety in those bland gray X-Wings and the original Star Wars, it's just more texture no matter how much color you put on it. And for the purposes of this movie and the tone and humor and just, you know, adventure feel to it, it works great. Boom. That was a nice little trick. <laughs> this is, okay, so you can already kind of tell. If you know Andy Dwyer from Parks and Rec, you know he's like a hapless wannabe ladies man. Here he is actually a ladies man. <laughs> Forgets about her. <laughs> yeah. So the humor in this movie, while, you know, almost as effective at, at a lot of times as Joss Whedon's, is totally different. And I talk about, you know, Whedon having everything from internal chuckles to huge belly laughs. But in fact, you know, the best part of Whedon, when he does a lot, are a lot of sort of witty ha-ha-has, which I enjoy because they're smart, or references to weird poems or historical events or something that nobody knows, even me. Um, and just, you know, hearing Hawkeye uh, talking himself down from, you know, shooting Quicksilver, nobody will know. I miss him already. And, and, you know, you're just dying. And, and I'm never dying laughing in this movie, but I'm constantly smiling. And there's something to be said for that. You know, I mean, this is a family PG-13 movie. Um. <laughs> he and Yondu have amazing chemistry. Ain't no orb, ain't no you. Oh, man. So apparently these guys really went at each other later. Rooker is this intense in real life, I believe, or, or close to it. And, you know, he really scared the shit out of, of uh, Chris Pratt, I believe. Steal from everybody. They <laughs> never taste the term before. The southern accent of the uh, the pirates. What the hell are they called? <laughs> and this is a case that George Lucas learned from. This guy with the beard on the left. Meant to only have two lines, but has a great look. And the direction right, he nails it. Okay, so behind Michael Rooker, who's playing Yondu here, the blue guy, and, and, you know, one of my like three or four only real problems in this is that all the practical aliens are blue. I think that's intentional. Um, I have some theories about why they're all blue, good guys and bad guys, totally different species. But the you know, the guy who we'll see later with the mohawk who's behind Yondu is James Gunn's brother, whose name I'm blanking on, the the younger Gunn, I believe. Sean Gunn is his name. Is a great number two, and is actually an actor. I mean, his brother cast him, obviously. But okay, so Ronan is one of the great, you know, one-dimensional villains of all time. And if you're going to be a great one-dimensional villain, it's all about performance. Now, <laughs> you know, if you compare Ronan to the operative played by Chiwetel Ejiofor uh, at Serenity, who for most of the movie is, is one-dimensional, but comes off as, you know, a fully realized person, even though he's a psycho with, you know, single-minded purpose, just because of Edgy Four's charisma and how he plays it, and with how Whedon wrote it, you know, this guy's supposed to be just straight-up evil. And the thing is, you know, they have similar goals, although, you know, Ronan, I think, is aware that he's just creating death and destruction. Edgy Four does have a grand plan that has to do with his ideology of a better world. You know, as he talks about his 
<laughs> is demonic utopia. But they, they went straight batty here with the purple. And the, you know, and I think the reason with the blue, and the, one of my theories uh, is that they knew in that end scene where that's like three minutes in the purple mist that all the colors of the people there had to work. So even the type of green on Gamora, who we just saw briefly played by Zoe Saldana, one of the many reasons I love this baby. I think I might be the only one, just because she doesn't have a huge emotional arc till later. She just seems like a killer here, which is a little bit of a reach for Zoe, uh, honestly. I, I mean, she kills it in this role as an assassin, but it's not as natural for her as Ahura, or even her character in Avatar. But when she gets to open up the cute and sweet later, or trying to be cute and sweet, the real Zoe comes out. Have I ever? Yeah, they give those lines to Zoe. Like in the, in the Star Trek reboot, she's the one who says, it's a new time loop or whatever it is, you know. It's a new timeline. All right, we'll get back to Zoe. Okay, Xandar, to me, really does not look much better than uh, the better uh, cityscape shots of star wars movies it really doesn't and i made the connection to the prequels i mean it's way better executed even than revenge of the sith which did get some cgi stuff right the final star wars prequel but because of these guys you got stanley being a creep on some young chick gotta have his cameo class a prevert and you know the reason i see these movies early is so you know the the sort of worship of these two characters, and I get it; they're great Hollywood characters. But people so love them; it was so predictable. Even while I was watching, I'm going, "Okay, these are the ones that the kids and the grown-ups are going to love. These two guys." But you know, you see it early, and you're not jaded by that stuff. And I'm not usually affected by that because I just watch the movie. Any preconceptions I have, if it's well done, are gone within five minutes. And the way this one was set up, with the little boy and his mom dying, and then the dancing scene in the cave. You know, you're in. I mean, th this movie moves at a great pace. Broker. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Sends us love. Best eyebrows in the business. Man, does Chris Pratt have great lines. Look at, I mean, that's the thing. They knew with Jurassic World, he just looks like a star. He does. He manages to look like a douchebag, a regular guy, a dirty hipster. And a sexy beauty star all at once. It's totally 2015. He just has it. He has it. I believe he was athletic in high school, so he actually had to gain weight for the Andy Dwyer role to be chubby in Parks and Rec, I believe. One of the great TV romances, him and April. All right, here comes the exposition while he's pushing him out the door. <sighs> And here's the thing, you know, I watch movies like this, and like, okay, it's a great comic movie, doing the commentary, oh man, Zoe Saldana eating space fruit, I die, uh, I just, I just want to get on my hands and knees and beg her to hang out with me for five minutes, <laughs> well, yeah. uh, I'm Peter Quill, people call me Star-Lord. Uh, she's so clearly fucking with him. He's such an idiot. It's great. This is the thing. I don't think they're going to get together in the second movie, which is the right move. They should continually be flirting and hinting at it, but this relationship will never work. I don't care what character development you do. I do want her to have a love interest, though. I don't want her to just get left stranded, because Zoe has great chemistry with everyone from Mark Ruffalo to Zachary Quinto. You know, she almost persuades you at Avatar with her CGI self that she has chemistry with Sam Worthington and helps that we don't have to watch Sam Worthington watch his Avatar. So this doesn't completely connect. I mean, yeah, it looks pretty good biting the hands. The orb fight here is great. You know, this is all comparative power stuff. Gotta see it. We get four out of the five here. So Quill's the smartest, or at least the most, not the smartest, he's the most clever in terms of pulling tricks. And as I was trying to get to earlier, oh, this is great. Zoe being left-handed, as they all are in Hollywood, with the blade. Boom, great shot. That was a little bit of a carry-on moss shot. Love it. Quill's already got a plan, you know. And, I mean, they they had to have them be a little equal. 
I don't learn it's one of my issues. You know, you had to sell that quilt could at least keep up with her briefly. But that trick there, you know, it's awesome. She should have seen it coming, but who cares? But this, this, but this is the thing. He's not Han Solo. He is in terms of the ladies and being kind of dumb but and lovable. Uh, <laughs> you're supposed to be a professional. Uh, yeah. Uh, but Quill doesn't, you know, fight hand to hand. I guess it fits his character. Okay, so this is comparative powers. Game, set, match. Zoe Saldana. As Gamora. But <laughs> Quill. Oh, here's the background here. This got big laughs. The thing is, he improved some of the funniest parts of the movies by accident. Yeah, you know, you can't control how the bag's gonna come off. They shoot it a bunch of times. As someone mentioned, this is the best uh, use of Rive in a movie ever. Rive, little man. Right, it's important that he keeps calling him an idiot. Establishes their relationship, but also how sad Rocket is later and regretful for being mean to Groot, even though Groot loves him and doesn't care. Yeah, and then they would just do this all in bright daylight in the public square, get arrested. Tyler Perry, another science fiction cameo. Okay, so John C. Riley, this is one of the best cameos ever. Star Prince. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, and this relationship is important. That guy looks so douchey on the lap. They, they got him just because he looks like a douche. Yeah, it's cool to have a code name. Not that weird. Oh man, yep, they, they're setting it all up. That's the thing. Like the Avengers, there's a thousand balls in the air, but they just line them up and take them down one by one. So everything's shiny. Like this reminds me of the Canary ship from Star Wars. Way cooler design, way more detailed, and in context of the building. But the thing is, they know when to go, like, Art Deco style. They know when to go just, like, straight glass. They know, I mean, they have a garden inside this conference room. It's just perfect. It makes no sense. Yeah, this guy's not convincing. They need to build up the cream more. I mean, if you just build up the cream more... Okay, so the girl the, right in the center there, she's so hot. I'm sorry. She's just beautiful. She does nothing but look beautiful in a number of scenes on Xandar. And it totally has to be intentional by James Gunn. Has to be. Has to be. And he's not doing it because it's eye candy. He's doing it because it's a joke about eye candy. He's challenging people like me to pay attention to the average-looking guy. It's denim her. It's just looking perky and, and sexy. I call it Kurt. Yep, they showed this in the trailers. There's a whole trailer based around this. Brilliant idea. Introduce the characters. So I was getting it earlier. So the nerd people that I love online who do the Modern Myth Media podcast did a great commentary. And uh, <laughs> they had to they had to blank out the figure in the, in the trailers. But even those guys, Modern Myth Media, didn't know a lot about Guardians. I mean, they knew some. They knew way more than me. Who knew nothing? I hadn't even heard of it. That's the thing. Of all the Marvel movies before now, I had at least heard of the characters: Thor, Cap, Hulk, whatever. So, I, you know. To say I had no preconceptions coming into this would be quite the understatement. Okay, so the jail scene is maybe the best scene in the movie. It's where they all come together for the first time by necessity. At the moment, everyone is looking confident that they're going to get out. Because they all have. You know, These guys all have reps. We just heard their whole background there with John C. Riley. So Gamora's looking like she's already assessing the situation while pretending that she's doing nothing, which is exactly what an assassin would do. Rocket's bragging about how many um, jails he's broken out of. Peter Quill is just looking just stupid. <laughs> yeah, well, you know who you are. So this was really hard to do. I was betraying him. It's a thing. I mean, Gamora in the early part of the movie isn't super compelling because the writing's not great for her. But once she opens up, it gets a lot better. And she becomes the heart of the crew against all odds. She becomes the heart at the end. It's amazing. That's Zoe Saldana. Vocabulistics. I and Am and Groot exclusively in that order. So this was very hard to do. This whole walk through many sets where you had Rocket in the middle and Groot in back. So the humans mixed in. And, you know, that takes a lot of work. It really looks like those guys are out there. 
So, uh, so the the Uga Chaka song, the I've Got a Feeling or whatever it is. So this is the one in the trailer, but in the movie they use it for a torture scene. Even in the trailer, it's like, hey, Guardians of the Galaxy party, man. Hooked on a feeling, sorry. Man, what a corny song. Perfect here. Okay, yeah, it's again. <laughs> Wow, he's jacked, man. Look at that. Ladies love uh, jacked <laughs> Chris Pratt. Um, these little bots look Star Wars, but well executed. You know, he, he there's not a lot of dynamic, crazy movement with the camera uh, that J.J. does or Joss does at times in this movie. They keep it very cinematic, which I dig for the most part. But they nail these shots right there. The way they frame rocket, you see his back, see what's going on. He's changing. Even him, the little weird raccoon, has to turn away because he's got man parts, I assume. But it forces Chris Pratt to see that, and it communicates so much. Um, that's actually probably Pratt's best moment of you know nonverbal drama in the movie just because it called for it. You know, And that was important to sell that look back there by, uh, by Star-Lord. <laughs> Um, Peter Quill, because that was the first time that we're like, okay, this guy maybe has empathy for other humans. And so you're like, why are they pelting Chris Pratt? Nope, they're pelting Zoe Saldana. She's killed a lot of people. And, you know, her backstory suggests that there's no way we should accept her as a good guy, even if she seems trustworthy because of her past sins. But... Oh, that's right. It's not necessarily her. It's just that she's associated with Ronan. But as we'll find, she was kidnapped by Thanos, tortured, worked upon. Actually, they're all genetic freaks. Well, her and Rocket and Groot are all kind of genetic freaks in their own way. Apparently, this was Nathan Fillion who played the body double here. You know, this guy looks a little flat to me for 2014. But when you have a CGI tree holding up a CGI monster alien, it, it looks pretty good. Um, okay, so right there, they're actually holding up a real guy with his legs. It, it, it looks too human. And that's why this scene is so great from an aesthetic uh, standpoint, is the mix of practical and uh, and CGI. And they do that great for the most part in the whole movie. And the only time it slips a little bit is in the final battle, because it's all CGI. And uh, we shall get there. Uh, so yeah, so that's Nathan Fillion, Captain Malcolm Reynolds from Serenity, another Serenity connection, uh, writhing on the floor back there after Groot uh, nostriled him, I believe is the official term. So this is an interesting choice. She's been so in control, you know, but she gets startled for a minute, but the way Zoe's playing, okay, she just took a gulp. I mean, you know, Zoe with the tiniest facial movements, as I've commented before, <laughs> Um, specifically in the Star Trek reboot, uh, the, uh, she's the tiniest little facial tics and and just things she can do with her face and her body to express so much without saying a thing. And so back there, it's not clear. She is a little scared more than we thought or she thought she was going to be, but you know, she's still mostly under control. You know, she makes this somewhat flat character. From a writing standpoint, totally worked for me. And maybe just because I'd come to love Zoe at this point. I mean, if Zoe had only done Ohora in the Star Trek movies, that would have been enough. But I've seen her in movies, big and small. And she's one of my faves. Great follow on social media, inspiring quotes from poets. She's politically active without being preachy or polemical or really, you know, <laughs> trying not to take sides but still being progressive. So... Everyone loves, uh, oh, let me rephrase that. Most people, if not all, you know, love Drax. And we all know he's a wrestler. He had been in like a Vin Diesel movie, I believe, but it's not a real actor, at least until now. And it was so over the top. So, uh, okay. So he gets funny about a minute from now when, when, he, when they do the throat slicing thing. And I wasn't sure whether to laugh or not. But everyone in the theater was hysterical, and so I laughed too. And that sold me on him. I'm like, well, oh, these people, it's a thing. 
you know, people do respond to good filmmaking, even if it's, you know, an actor that's hardly an actor, really doesn't deserve to be there other than how he looks. He just fits in with the crew. They have great chemistry. Okay, so this is where the movie flips because there has been a lot of one-dimensionality so far with those two, with Ronan. You know, you got this goofy guy, crazy raccoon in the tree. You're like, okay, how did these two fit in? <laughs> right. <gasps> Smoking hot Rajak girl. Stab me with a fork. <laughs> they get the Korea and try to rip out his thorax. Man, they're brutal. And Escavarian. <laughs> and later, Jack goes, You who have lain with the Lascavarian. He remembers it in the story. Yeah, and that's the thing. Because of Chris Pratt's slightly cheesy delivery, it's yeah. Okay, that's the thing. You're going. Oh, this is an a a. This is an a level pulpy movie. It's an a level movie that has pulpy parts. But then they throw in this with the throat slit. People were dying in the theater. People love this. And so I bought into it, and I went along with Drax, and <laughs> it gets even better as it goes along. Brilliant casting. I mean, it's one thing to cast Zoe Saldana. That's always going to be brilliant casting. But to cast this guy? As per usual, unclear what Star-Lord's motives are in saving Gamora, other than she's hot, I suppose. I guess it's because of the orb. Right, oh, right. So, so, Quill and Gamora want the orb. Groot and Rocket want to turn in uh, Peter Quill as a bounty. And Drax just wants to kill Ronan. Oh, we're getting out. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, so, you know, not everyone can get their way here. <laughs> they don't want different things from each other. I like that you hear like 50 units earlier and she's just like 4 billion units. Mm. That's the thing. She adds like an almost regal bearing to this character because she is a, a princess. I mean, she's the adoptive daughter of Thanos, the most powerful being in the universe that we know of so far. But Lee Pace, he's like a really sweet guy, apparently. It just nails this this creepazoid. He's really scary. Look at those purple eyes. So yeah, so as I was saying earlier, the purple-blue aesthetic on purpose. They needed to nail the final scene. We'll get back to that. And they, the colors had to be just right. Even Gamora's green had to fit in. And that's the thing. You have these matte paintings, and I love that. Look how beautiful that galaxy is. It makes no sense that they're just standing on this comet, but who cares? It's beautiful. It's beautiful and it's static, you know? J.J. Abrams wouldn't shoot it like this, but, you know, we need lots of different visions. Oh, he just kills this guy, right? Boom. Yeah, the fact that Thanos just doesn't go after Ronan um, at this point, not totally clear. She is great. I forget her name. Oh, man. So Thanos is the big bad villain they've been teasing since the Avengers in 2012. We're not going to see him until 2018 in full glory. In the two-part Avengers finale. But, you know, the CGI is getting slightly better on him. I just don't. They're trying to make him look too human. They should have gone more comic booky, I think. They wanted to do the performance capture with Josh Brolin, but it's just not working for me. I don't know. Maybe there's just too much buildup. Thanks, Dad. Look how sexy she is. Watch this walk. Oh, you know, I mean, they make her look so weird, but the facial design is perfect. It's all blue. Even if it's metal, it's painted blue. It's all very appealing. It's sexy, you know? I mean, she's she's a fully, she's not human, obviously, but she's she's more than a robot, but she does have some, like, Japanese fembot thing going on. The way she moves, oh, my God. Yeah, her and Zoe are great in their fight later. (laughs) 
One of the great payouts ever. The leg. And they, and they reprise it later with the guy's prosthetic eye. Alright, so before Peter Quell, being a dummy, nevertheless, always looking to save his own ass, gets suddenly clever whenever he's got to save his own ass, realizes that Rocket's their best hope. This little thing. Foul mouth and bad attitude. Yeah, Chris Pratt's overacting, and he probably does in Jurassic World, which I, I just never saw. But it's it's just so appealing, and he's got a great look. And and the thing is, when he doesn't know what to do, he just gets this spaced-out look like Andy Dwyer in Parks and Rec, you know, like he smoked a little too much weed or something, or is recovering from a hangover, and, and you're always right back with him. Oh, yeah, that's great. Just as the plan is revealed, Groot ruins it. Uh, lag. <laughs> Yep, that's the thing. They're selling the teamwork. Yeah, Rocket's the tactical leader. It's great. Yeah, Zoe's the best warrior. Gamora's the best warrior. Chris Pratt's, you know, just a charismatic one that eventually ends up leading them because of his, you know, Han Solo qualities. Uh, Rocket's the brains. Groot's the muscle. I guess Drax is the muscle as well. They got a lot of muscle. They need it later. So this looks great. So these little bots that are flying around, I mean, this is something that could have been in the Star Wars prequels, but it's so much better executed. Look how real this looks. The real bullets, no lasers. I mean, we see lasers later, but right here, bullets to be flying everywhere. For some reason here, Groot looks extra real. He looks great the whole time, but with the bullets flying off, and they have this, like, CGI, you know, like, wood chips flying off as he gets hit. The lighting is so perfect. I mean, it's totally atmospheric. Totally by that this guy's in the middle of this room. Boom, he puts up the extra tree branch to block from the bullets. Rockets right at his back. Oh, this is great. Yeah. You know, at this point, Drax is just wants violence against people he dislikes. He's like Jane. You know? Although his, his motives of revenge, we'll get back to later. You think it's honorable and noble, but it's quite selfish, and he does admit it. Oh, this is great. Okay, for me, from an action standpoint, I, this is where I'm in. Boom. Oh, the rifle. Music. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So you see the oh, yeah, uh, by itself in the trailer. Now you're going, you got to be shitting me. We got Call of Duty with a rocket and Groot. Oh, man. He's a total psycho. It's like Scarface. And then right here. You need my what? <laughs> oh, this scene is fantastic. Uh, this this act, I should say. Oh, dude. Uh, uh, man, the hand-to-hand of Gamora in this movie is spectacular. That jump up in the air, you know, double foot kick. Oh, here we go. I'll figure something out. Breaks his arm. I mean, that's the thing. Zoe can be ruthless. She does it all, man. Sweetheart and ruthless at the same time. This guy looks like uh, Carl Urban's cousin. <laughs> Uses the leg. That's, you know, people are like, well, the leg came in handy. Well, no, he only needs to use the leg because he went to go get it and then had to come back. So, in fact, it all evened out. And Chris Pratt does nothing in this fight. And I guess that's maybe the running gag. It's not clear why he's the leader. The other four are so much more effective than he is. He's got the guns and the rocket boosters on his feet. But, uh... Oh, the jump from Gamora. Boom! Yep, gotta have some superhero stuff. Don't be ashamed of it. You don't have to show it a ton. Oh, uh, the music here. So that's the thing. The, you know, the, the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s music soundtrack is, is fantastic. But the score by Tyler Bates is so good. I have the track of the final, you know, orbs exploding scene I, called Black Tears. <laughs> you have laden with the Alaska variant. It was one time, man. Um, the Tyler Bates soundtrack is great. And, and this is maybe the best Marvel soundtrack so far. Better than the Thor movies, better than Avengers. Winter Soldier was pretty awesome. Da, da, da. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, way better than the Avengers theme, as people have commented. Oh, that was... <laughs> uh, yeah, they kill a few people. You see a little, yeah, little shaky cam in here, because this is where they have to confront each other, moving the camera a little bit. This is a good filmmaking, people. You change up the style when the scene calls for it. You get in close quarters, you get tension, move the camera around, shake it around. Just pretend, even if it's on a fucking stand, a tripod. 
<laughs> All right, here's the like thing. Again, very unjust Whedon, but still hilarious within the Marvel context. It's great. James Gunn's brilliant. Uh, there was a woman who co-wrote, it, or at least wrote the first draft, named Nicole something, who is actually writing for them again for Captain Marvel, which we're all pumped for yet another awesome female superhero. Here's the thing. I mean, it's it's Zoe Saldana and it's Scarlett Johansson. Now you got Elizabeth Olsen with Scarlet Witch. Those three, I mean, that's a huge big three. But they cast someone like Katie Sackhoff or Catherine Winnick for Captain Marvel. Those four. Here we go. The biggest idiots in the galaxy. Yeah. It's a lot of... So if Joss has a lot of internal chuckles, there's a lot of mildly external chuckles of this one, which I like. It's a nice change of pace. This is so... Right. They wait to do the full fire. You know, they have the countdown. I think there's multiple countdowns in this movie. Every great sci-fi epic has to have at least one countdown. (sighs) Yeah, the acting is is not good from Drax, but the character totally works for me. And they're so comfortable with him. I think that's the key. They embraced him. Dave Bautista is his name. He embraced them. On my command! It's like Battlestar. What? Okay, so this makes no sense. Because even if they start flying, why are they letting go of their guns? One or two of them can at least direct the shot. But yeah, you see the prisoners floating. Very well executed. All these guys are on wires. It's it's impressive. They spent a ton of money on this whole set. Because this is where you had to sell all the characters individually and by themselves. I mean, we hadn't even met Drax yet before here. Great Guardians music. Sounds totally like, you know, it's somewhere between Star Wars and Firefly. It's not the straight up Western, but it has that sort of uh, frontier adventure excitement to it. Here we go. It's swelling. Sorry, people, I can't help it. I love this music. Look at this. Oh, this is great. The interiors look awesome. That's the ironic thing. The huge cosmic landscapes are amazing. These practical interiors, so fantastic. Look at this. Completely seamless. The green screen through the windshield. I mean, you know, it might as well not even be there. Hitting the guards. Killing people by accident. Not caring. Boom. That was amazing. But yeah, the irony is, you know... That's it. Chris Pratt buys so much goodwill by, you know, 80% of his performance that the 20% you're like, eh, you know, who cares? I mean, that's the thing. That's Even when Harrison Ford was fully Han Solo in Return of the Jedi and actually became a good actor, I mean, he starred in Empire, but really he was comfortable in Return of the Jedi. And Carrie Fisher was a big part of that. It's ironic that a very, very, very young woman who's almost a girl when they started the whole thing was the far superior actor to Harrison Ford who's significantly older, had some experience. But anyways... He preserved a little bit of that pulpiness, and it was purposeful by him and Lucas at that point. You know, you need it for these for these central male characters. You know, they're reckless, they're funny, both intentionally and unintentionally. Right. So he's always used the guns. You know, I mean, it looks like the operative <laughs> stun gun. Against Mel, whatever, it's fine. But he does have to fight with his hands. Now, the mask that lets him fly briefly in space makes zero sense. Since it looks like a hologram, so I'm not sure what it's doing in terms of breathing apparatus. Is a brilliant design. Apparently, that's from the original comics. Glad they did that. Yeah, here we go. They're going to leave with the orb. And there's little things. Like Gamora not thinking that he had the orb. You know. That's the thing. <laughs> He's continually trying to impress her with heroism that's not heroism, and she never buys it. But it's these little clever tricks, like stealing the orb while pretending to give it to her, she has to respect, which makes the very end where he gives Yondu the fake orb with the, you know, with the bait and switch. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> That's the thing. You guys will be going, we're not leaving without the orb. And then we got this music. Oh, behold. A classic. That's a great delivery. I mean, that's just a great image. So, you know, Peter Quill doesn't fight hand to hand. What are you going to do? But if you're going to make him go Harrison Ford, 
you know, Chris Pine, um, Nathan Fillion. At some point, someone's got to beat the shit out of him. <laughs> You're an imbecile. This doesn't all hit for me, but I don't care because the characters are so engaging and the humor that does work. I mean, that's the thing. I say that about the Avengers. You know, Whedon swings for the fences. He hits 95%. Here they hit like 85 to 90%. I, I prefer that in some ways, at least at times, to movies where it's like f just so flawless that it's almost too perfect. I like it a little messy. And in these epics, you got to get messy. And that's the thing. Original Star Wars movies were messy in a, in a beautifully chaotic way. And the prequels failed for many reasons, but the central one being the desire for too much control. And blowing up moons. <laughs> you want to suck the fun out of everything. I just want to blow up some moons. Right, so Rocket's already building the device to try and kill Ronan in the end, which fails, but and this is great chemistry. That's the thing. They have such good chemistry once they start interacting. And even though Zoe is, is the better, you know, <laughs> he'll destroy us all. Oh, man, I love Zoe. I agree. I'm not a princess. Right, nobody's killing anybody on my ship. <laughs> But um, because of the writing and him being the main character, they had to have Quill, Chris Pratt's character, you know, make the first move in terms of, you know, make a move on Zoe, as we'll see in a bit. But, uh, you know, but also in terms of, you know, his acting and, and, and the performance and they have Zoe come around slowly. Oh, he's looking at her butt. Damn, she's got a nice body. I'm sorry, people. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. <laughs> this place will look like a Jackson Pollock painting. All right. So the fact that young Peter Quill would know Jackson Pollock and that Rocket would get the reference enough to put together what he's insinuating that, you know, there's jizz everywhere or whatever from his sexual encounters. <laughs> um... Oh, they killed Carl Urban's cousin. <laughs> so you know, so they let um, they let they let Zoe come around slowly, which fits with her character. You know, despite all of their efforts to make her a you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, no one can. He'd be full of serious. All right, so that's James Conn's brother, Sean. He's great. He's always echoing his captain, but sounding even stupider. <laughs> Open it and open it. This is brilliant. This is inspired acting right here. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still doing it, bola bola baba. <sighs> the slow build of the uh, the deadly era that can take out ships and dozens of soldiers at once. But you know, <laughs> Gamora ends up really having <laughs> the best soul in the end, as much as they try and make her a uh, cold blooded assassin, and that's just Zoe. You can't contain it, you know. You can have her being a assassin for a while. There's a dark owl from Thor. That's a creepy sight. This is all very creepy. Right, he says, like, get on your knees, or you know what knees are for. And, you know, oh, the imprisoned last one. Um, You know, I mean, when you tell a woman... <laughs> It's a dull podcast, people. Let's just say that how he was talking to her was not very respectful and had some weird connotations to it. Um, I'll say that. This is David Bowie. Oh, another gorgeous Cosmo shot. This is like this is my background art on my computer. It's constantly going to NASA downloading images like this. Of course, the giant uh, Titan skull or whatever it is. Nowhere. Oh, it's spelled like no. Like I know something. I had no idea. Severed head of a celestial being. That's the thing. You're like, oh, I want to see the celestial being. And the great part is, we're going to see one. Not this big, but pretty damn big. Uh, oh, right. They re I'm an idiot. Nowhere. I think I was just looking at this beauty. This looks great. I mean, this is what the prequels should have looked like. 
you know, with all the various hive caves and stuff they went to. Maybe I just don't like the 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 uh, that blue and orange that we see everywhere with the ships because it's the Mets colors. I'm a Phillies fan. I hate the Mets colors, uh, but they're great colors. You know, I'm forced to admit it. I, I bought Adidas shoes that look like a Mets uniform. It was a it was a sacrifice, but they're pretty dope. I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go, Billy the Kid, Bud and Clyde, John Stamos. <laughs> and that's the thing you know the Jackson Pollock thing you're like yeah, he's too young but for him to think that John Stamos was like a great action hero makes total sense at his age in 1986 with Full House you know he was the smoothest he was the coolest he had the beautiful lady but oh uh, what a moment and that's the thing that's the thing they buy so much goodwill cause here's the th this is all coming from a good place there's so much heart to this movie you know, even things that seem to be like emotional manipulation, like coming up where Rocket gets too drunk and starts fighting with Drax and saying, I didn't make myself like this and starts crying. It's just, you know, the, the, the logic behind it is so real and you add the performance. And, you know, I mean, maybe after Guardians 2, this galaxy will start feeling truly real. Not just a bunch of set pieces. And it's not their fault. You have two hours to create an entire... That's the thing. They've started hinting at the cosmic and the other Marvel properties, but this one is all in space. And it's like taking place... Like every ten minutes, they're traveling a greater distance than anyone on Earth. Uh, and the Avengers, like, on timeline has ever even thought to do it, other than maybe Thor. Here we go. And then this is great. And what's so great about this is you think... Zoe's going to give in, not just because he's smooth, but because if you know Zoe Saldana from her other roles, you can just feel her heart opening up and that in this character, you know, she would want to break through and just be a real person. But the assassin comes out at the perfect time. So she's doing the Ahura thing with the, eye, with the bat and the eyelashes and looking pouty. But serious, and she really connects to this. So right, so his mom died, and his dad, who knows? Then he got abducted. She got abducted. Her real parents were killed. So they're relating over the parents. Okay, this is it. I mean, if you if you know if you hadn't seen the Star Trek movies or you didn't really know who Zoe Saldana was, I'm a warring assassin. I do not dance. This is it. This is this is. Oh man. Footloose. <laughs> A great hero. Named Kevin Bacon. What a brilliant delivery. Sticks up their butts. Right. Yeah, it's true. He has to teach her that. And she starts learning at the end. She has to teach him to grow up and be more mature and less selfish. Oh, look at that smile. I think, okay. That Zoe smile right there when Kamara was smiling is slightly out of character at this point. I think she was laughing a little bit at some line that Chris Pratt was delivering and they just had a camera on her. But it was just subtle enough, even for Gamora, <laughs> that Melanie is pleasant, that they kept, that they put that shot of her smiling, even though it's, you know, kind of... It, laughing when she wasn't supposed to, maybe, but controlling it. I, I don't know. I've seen so many of these movies a million times, watch all the commentaries. I don't remember hearing that specifically, but that looked improv like a spontaneous <laughs> improv. And she's still yelling because she's got the headphones on. Here we go. <laughs> Pelvic sorcery. <laughs> Her best two lines of the movie are pelvic sorcery, and then when they crash the sh the ship... With a zero connection to what the reference was, she just goes, we're just like Kevin Bacon. Pelvic sorcery. Oh, God. How did... First of all, how did James Gunn come up with pelvic sorcery? That is true. That is also true. No respect. All right, he's calling him Berman. So, in the uh, various roundtables and commentaries on modern myth media, and I love all these guys, and I don't remember who said who, 
a few of them, or a couple of them, thought that this scene was unnecessary because of the amazing image earlier of Peter Quill looking so sad, seeing all the you know, implants that were forced on him on his back as he was changing. But I, I disagree. You you need this. You need a rocket to take a big step to be just drunk and beyond rage and hatred and sadness and to just say, fuck it. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> yeah. Right, it's true. And Quill has no friends either, but not for these reasons. Yeah, the, these other four are always trying to kill people. Quill's just trying to, you know, hustle people. The Ravagers, I suppose, are his friends by circumstance. We don't need them. Right, conveniently get Drax away. Now Drax is mad and drunk. Oh, she's so creepy. I love that actress. That's such a tough role to play. You know. I mean, is she an android? Is she not? Hard to tell. The red skin, and we see red skinned aliens later, seem to indicate that she's part of a real, not a real, you know, a, a organic species. <laughs> I love that. The dog and the raccoon growling at each other. Oh, here we go. One of the best reveals ever. With the music. But with those goggles and his space Liberace thing, as has been mentioned before. Benicio Del Toro, this is so great. And the thing is, I hadn't seen Thor Dark World, I don't think, at this point with the cameo, or I missed the cameo at the end of it. <laughs> He's so creepy. <laughs> they know each other, of course. <laughs> so Benicio, in this short time, sells the, you know, the the human connection to the CGI guy that's not there as well as anything in the movie. He tries to stand on his tippy toes to get closer and whisper to him. He wants to buy his carcass at the moment of your death, of course. Practical, yeah. Very pragmatic. Take the money. Uh-oh. That's your bet. Oh. God, is he... He's mean. He's a really... Oh, God. He's so good. Okay, so this is this didn't that was not planned. How was that not planned? That's such a Chris Pratt Andy Dwyer move to drop the orb. And I, when I saw it, I'm like, okay, I guess it's kind of predictable. But then it's been confirmed that it was not supposed to happen. He actually dropped it. I don't know if I believe it. Oh, my new friends! Here we go. Best comic book exposition ever. Look at this orb, the purple. Oh, all right. So I, I had gotten immersed enough at this point to know a little bit about the Infinity Stones. Uh, that that particular uh, timeline, look at that orb coming apart with the robotic hands. So they're showing us all the stones here. That's the thing. E even in Ultron, we only see the four that have been revealed. We're getting all six here. Uh, here's one of the celestial beings. What were they called? I missed it. Are they are they celestials? Yeah, they're celestials. <laughs> There's little peak coming out. I mean, this is it. I mean, like I was a comic book guy. I knew a little bit about this, but the Infinity Gauntlet, the stones, this is all pretty new to me. 2014 was the year I got into it. Winter Soldier and this. These two movies hooked me on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I hadn't even seen a lot of the solos beyond compare, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Right, and then they have Rocket, you know, they have Rocket mock his little hand gesture there, which I'm sure, you know. I, I wonder if that was instructed to Benicio, and then he just embellished it. So this is an interesting device in terms of plot. You know, you want her to do this because she's basically a slave and close to dead, so she kills herself, blows up his whole, you know, twisted workshop here that looks a little bit like John Sebastian's workshop in uh, the end of Blade Runner, which is the best part of the movie, that whole end sequence, the puppet maker. Oh, that's so cool, her body exploding. I guess the idea was 
when you touch the power stone. That's what happens. Boom. Okay, so the entire top of the superstructure explodes. These two guys, you know, are the only ones making it out alive because of Groot saving Rocket the jump. Look at that. Boom. They have a few shots in this movie of... of of Rocket just shooting straight up on Rocket's face. And yet, you know, Zoe and Pratt, you know, looking fake scared here. What the f <laughs> You know, and Benicio are still in the building. They're somehow still alive. Makes no sense. Doesn't matter. Looks great. I love how you can just shove. It's, like, extremely hard to open the orb. I guess the idea is Benicio truly opened it, and now you can just kind of open it and shut it. Because they do that a couple times. I mean, that's part of the, <laughs> part of the plot. A big part of the plot. Right. Chris Pratt's a saint. Wants to save the galaxy. <laughs> yeah, just practical. I live in the galaxy. Dumbass, though, do you? We're all going to die. I mean, you know... There are very few actresses who would not be overacting in this case. I mean, this is Zoe and Carrie Fisher, as far as I'm concerned, can deliver these lines of sort of obvious exposition. You're despicable and dishonorable, faithless. Yeah. What does he say? I, I think my plans will get compromised. Oh, this is a great image. Yeah, he's going to take out this whole fleet with two knives. So, yeah, you have to have this battle with Ronan. Have Ronan get the orb. Oh, right, in the Ravagers. <sighs> oh, man. Okay, so the blocking on, on all this movement, very difficult. So many players, plus the civilians. Ronan the Accuser, what a great name. Yeah, Ronan has great uh, connotations, the word. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you just give Zoe anything, and she makes it work. And you just want more. That's the thing. I'm so pumped for more Gamora. And they pretty much confirmed there's going to be more Gamora in the fourth. My guess is Drax stays somewhat in the background, which is, you know, Clayta, Clayta. She loves saying that. I don't know idea what that means. What's her name? Nebula. Yeah, Nebula. I thought she, when I first saw this movie in the theater, I thought she was, um, you know, in the Matrix Revolutions, you know, there's a few good things. One is Nona Gay as Z, you know, defending Zion, looking beautiful, sexy, brave, scared, and awesome all at the same time. And Chara, who's the other woman fighting with her militant badass that, with the shaved head, looks similar to this woman. But weirdly, although Chara is very pretty in an intense, militant way in revolutions, this woman is really beautiful. I mean, it doesn't matter how much makeup you put on her. She's just stunning. The uh, the woman who plays Nebula, she'll be back. They kept her alive on purpose. Right. I mean, again, with the orange and blue, I just don't get it. I mean, it looks fine, and they scuff it up. I mean, look, they learn... Yeah, I mean, the cockpits are are, uh, you know, foggy, and there's dirt on it, and they scuffed up the armor. Right, that Rocket wouldn't think of this on him on his own. Whatever. Looks great. Amazing concept. Always fun to be able to kamikaze and survive. I think later in the movie, Drax says something like, I think of Sakaran's like, paper soldiers or something. Oh, here we go with Rocket, head on. Yeah, baby. And what's great is they used it again in the final battle because it looks so great. It's such an iconic image. Rocket in the spaceship screaming, coming head on. You know, some people and characters just shoot head on. You know? Chris Pine is Kirk. Shoot him head on. They shoot Spock from the side and an angle. Zoe, shoot her anyway. Domhnall Gleeson, Ex Machina, head on. Oscar Isaac, 45 degree angle. You know, it's not just about being attractive. It's about, you know, the facial features and the emotion. And that's the thing. I mean, Rocket shows so much emotion. It's like Yoda level, at least. This is great. This fight's brutal. No fancy choreography. 
you know, Ronan just toying with him. Oh, man. Oh, the reverse backwards neck slam. I think we missed Ronan just, like, punching him 50 feet back. So, not really clear. So, the Kree seem to be powerful. Ronan, without the Infinity Stone and his hammer, which is going to happen soon, ridiculously strong. You know what, though? I don't need to know the details of this universe, just like I don't need to with Star Wars. Leave it mysterious. Leave it up to our imaginations. This is beautifully choreographed. Oh, and then you add the, you know, the uh, part painting, part CGI, cosmic nebula background. Yeah, I mean, the names, Ronin, Nebula, Gamora, you know, they're from the comic books. So I'm cool with it. I would have gone a different way, maybe, but who cares? Right here. This is awesome. Look at that. Blows up the ship. But they do, because of the relative smallness of the attacking ship, Nebula's even sad for a minute. She's a great actor. God damn. I gotta look up her name. Sorry, people. I used to know. It's been a while since I've seen this movie. Yeah, image of Zoe Saldana floating in space. And this decision from Peter Quill makes no sense. And that's the whole point. The whole point, this is the first time he acts irrationally good. He's constantly acting rationally bad or amoral. And now he's irrationally good. And what's going to make this great from a retroactive standpoint, I think if they do what I think they're doing, which is not make them actual love interests, like their flirty interests, but they won't end up together, will make the sacrifice even more powerful, even though he tries to make another kissy-kissy move with her after this. Bragging about his heroism at the wrong time. Yeah, it's great. He saves her. He's lying on top of her. She's like almost ready to make out with him for doing something like that. And he blows it. And then gets his ass kicked by Yondu. Oh, man. They really rip into each other. I've heard a lot of stories about this. But Chris Pratt was getting, was getting, getting, you know, uh, frustrated or just pissed at, at, at a uh, rooker. And this music. You're going, okay, I know exactly where this music is going. The romance. The slowly. Um, layered strings but the emotional drama's there I mean look at his face you know it's starting to turn to icicles on their face which is what happens in space because it's like far sub-zero conditions and this is the first hint that he's not fully human you don't, you don't really realize this till a second viewing I suppose it looks just like a space effect and maybe it is look at that background though that's the thing who cares if it's static it's gorgeous And I've been talking about the old game Myst from the 90s, the first, you know, 3D rendered art, but it's all hand-drawn, and it's static, but it's just so beautiful. Just make it look cool and appealing and beautiful and awesome. I'm always saying this. That was a great effect with the tractor beam. We know they could do the tractor beam from the beginning. Here we go. This is great. Because we've already been misdirected once that they're going to hook up, right? We've already been misdirected. Already been misdirected. Cool, here we go. Zoe's selling it. She's she's recovering, but she's getting hot for him, too. I mean, Zoe's not afraid to show a little sexuality. Look at her. She's actually considering this. I couldn't let you die. And the music, and that's what's great. They put in the cheesy love music because they know they're going to stop it and have her just start insulting him. It's brilliant. Incredibly heroic. And she just rolls her eyes so subtly. Not to brag, but objectively. (laughs) What? She's a... That Sean Gunn's a lefty, too. It's amazing, man. I'm going to do a whole podcast about lefties. The problem is, it's anyone... Male or female who's held a gun in Hollywood, it's like 80% lefty. It's so crazy. But it really works. 
because it adds, especially in these movies, I know this is going to sound weird, but we're so used to in normal life or, or just normal action characters or whatever, like shooting with the right hand, like everyone shoots with the right hand, right? But to see these big time Hollywood actors fight with the left hand with the swords and the knives and, and the guns, uh, it just adds an extra weirdness to it. It's so great. And this is it. Rocket's totally right. He was right in the argument before where he was getting insulted, and he's right again. And, you know, Drax has to admit. And this is actually where I buy him, despite his, his one-liners. He's such a simplistic, you know, character. Or, he's sim- <laughs> he's simple-minded, let's put it this way. Not single-minded, but he's... <laughs> right, he get. He's trying to get sympathy from Rocket. A Rocket just says, oh, boo-hoo. I don't care if it's mean. Right. And this is the thing. Everyone's got dead people. It's no excuse to get everyone else dead along the way. You know? Rocket's right about that. He seems ruthless, heartless, soulless, but he's really not. He's just angry. He wants respect. He hates getting stomped on. He's still angling for running from Ronan. <laughs> But Groot's, nope. Yeah. Right, this is the whole Chewie Han thing. I mean, you gotta do it. Yeah. They're the only friends we've ever had. These guys have been together forever, and they've never had other real friends. And they're barely friends. They've been at each other's throats. But Rocket can already sense the friendship potential. This is great. I, I, some people didn't like this line. This cracked me up. Beat, yeah, you're making me beat up grass. What I love about it, it's subtle things. You could say, you're making me kick grass. Nope, you're making me beat up grass. Way better. James Gunn or um, Nicole What's-Her-Face. I'm sorry, I'm getting these names wrong. It's not out of disrespect. I just, I do so many of these podcasts. I love so many nerd properties. I try and remember actors and directors. I know the primaries. I haven't mentioned, by the way, that Groot is Vin Diesel and Rocket is the voice of Bradley Cooper because everyone knows that, and they are amazing. Bradley Cooper, performance of a lifetime. I mean, you know, you compare this, Silver Linings Playbook, and Wedding Crashers, could you have three more different characters with such high levels of difficulty of execution? Oh, yeah, yeah. And Jiman Hansu, he's not going to ask. This is an awesome concept. And this is the thing. This is the fantasy thing. They nail it more than Thor, even though this is more straight-ahead science fiction than Thor. Although, because the technology is so much higher, it looks crazier in some ways. There's Thanos on the screen. Looks great, on the, like the Emperor on the screen. That's intentional. But, you know, in fantasy, it's not just about getting magical power gems. It's about putting them in your fucking you know, longsword, <laughs> you know, and taking down armies. It's totally utilitarian. It's a place to store it. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I love the hammer with the orb. Yeah, Gamora, you know, faithless, dishonest, disingenuous, but she's still sticking up for him. Right. Yeah, Peter, you know, we had to have the scene. Peter Quill has been wanting to say, you know, 20 years you've been Saying you saved me, but you stole away from my planet. You abducted me. Rocket was abducted. We don't know what happened to Groot. Gamora was abducted. They sell that great. And it's still subtle, though. It's still subtle. Because the characters are so different. If you really think about it, they've had very similar pasts from a general standpoint. All right, and here's Gamora actually out thinking quill or no they start thinking together here she's planting the idea of how to get out of the situation and then he picks up on it they've got one thing working for them and that's gamora gamora's you know they need gamora to get the orb (laughs) <laughs> Captain's got to teach stuff. <gasps> oh, man. If that was Sean Gunn's only line, it'd be great. He's such a fantastic side character. Also, uh, this is not super secret of knowledge. Sean Gunn was the stand-in double for Rocket 
and he would kneel for like hours at a time, which is so hard and so painful just so they could block things. You know, he'd be walking on his knees or, or crouch walking, you know, like like that scene in, in the jail when they first get there and they're walking through all the hallways. They would shoot it with Sean Gunn and then they would wipe out Sean Gunn the way they would Andy Serkis as Gollum. Yeah, he's trying to sell the adventure. <laughs> this guy, he looks like... <laughs> And this is what's great about Michael Rooker as Yaddo. You never know, and he really wants to kill someone or is just fucking with them. He sells pretty well that he was ready to kill Quill, but maybe he... <laughs> I was dying. The chip is one one thousandth attention idiots. <laughs> a Hadron Enforcer. He calls Rex a lunatic in a complimentary way. Right, you think this could be a big plot point and there's going to be a fight? <laughs> Tear a very big new one. Unclear what the Hadron Enforcer would do to the ship. I mean, it doesn't even kill Ronan. Hey, Quill, what's going on? Yeah, he's already excited. Oh, and they go right to the scene. Okay, this is the scene of movie. This is this is the you know Avengers coming together scene. That's the or you know the conclusion of the sort of group origin story, or, or or you know the end of the beginning, but also the beginning of a new beginning. Right, and here's where you think Rocket's maybe uh, uh, mistranslating Groot, but Groot does not object. And that's the thing, because this is old school heist stuff, exposition doesn't sound like exposition. It's just old school heist stuff. It's planned. Here we go. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> okay, so he says I have 12% of a plan. That must be a reference to... Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> I wasn't listening. I was thinking of someone else. That that's that's what locked Drax into me. That, you know, that's what locked Drax in for me. And is you know that was a big step for him. That that moment of subtle comedy, right? The fake laugh that they make fun of is great. To act a fake laugh, thinking that your character is laughing for real, or or the character thinking is, I mean, Bradley Cooper just. If you watch Bradley Cooper um, recording, he's so emotive. He's moving his arms all over the place. He's making all sorts of faces. These guys are such professionals these days. What they have to do, shooting out of order, on sets, on location, CGI, reshoots, ADR, re-recording sound, pickups. Oh, man, there it is. That's the Zoe face. You know? You can try and make her... Such a cold-hearted bitch, but she's just not. But she can play it because she's that talented. But that Zoe Hart is coming out at some point. I mean, I'm just melting right now looking at her, and she's barely showing anything compared to Ahura, who's so super expressive. Right here it is. This is this is this is Mal and Serenity talking about you know, actually doing some, to give a shit. All right, exactly. We're not. We're not here to be the good guys. We're here to give a shit, and we can do something about this, not run away. So the 12% of a plan thing, um, <laughs> barely a concept, another great uh, Gamora line. It has to be a reference to the, the beginning of the Avengers where, you know, Tony Stark's trying to give Pepper Potts some credit for the new tower, and he's, and he's like, give yourself 12%. An argument can be made for 15 And, uh, and and then he immediately realizes that, you know, he shouldn't have said that to his girlfriend. And Robert Downey Jr. goes, I'm going to pay for that. I'm going to pay for that 12% uh, comment later in some subtle way. It, and Gwyneth goes, not going to be so subtle. And like two minutes later, you know, Robert Downey Jr. says, I thought we were having a moment. And Gwyneth goes, I was having 12% of a moment. And there's just... Total admiration between both the characters and the actors, those two amazing actors, Gwyneth and Downey, in that moment. Just fabulous. 
Yep, everyone's standing up, joining it, but the music's great. Right, it's about his wife and daughter. He's ready to die. Even Peter Quill is getting inspired. But this is it. Oh, man. Yeah. Rocket is looks shocked that Groot would, <laughs> would be into this idea. That he would get behind it. I don't got that long a lifespan. Oh, poor Rocket. I hope they find a way to make him live longer. Um, yeah. Okay. Where else do I have now? Bunch of, okay. <laughs> Bunch of Jack guys is standing in circle, which is exactly the Guardians joke you would expect, but apparently that was improv by Sean Gunn, the body double. James Gunn, the director's br brother. And I don't know what they were planning to do to end the scene. There's no way with this sense of humor... And, the, you know, the tone of, of the dialogue that they were going to end it with them just looking at each other, tearing up, you know, teamwork, yay. I think they were they were maybe planning on a on an improv from Pratt. But, yeah, this guy here, Sean Gunn. All right, so Karn is paper people. Whoop. Nope, don't punch him in the arm. Sean Gunn came up with that. Absolutely brilliant. Standing around, bunch of jackasses. And this is great. You see all their weapons, their new body suits. So, you know, I much prefer Zoe in the black leather suit at the end, which I think is going to be her costume, but they needed to make them look like Ravagers. Um, there's no female Ravagers. Uh, right, the orbs for everyone. You know, so they had to make Zoe have the <laughs> John C. Riley watering his plants. <laughs> Not a great selfie from Peter Quill. Yeah. <laughs> but what makes this uh what makes this recall from the early the earlier version with the leg is, is it's really important to me. So I mentioned at the end about how, you know, Zoe plays it so she mm, we're not sure whether Gamora knows that Peter Quill scammed Yondu with the orb. I think she knew the way she laughs. <laughs> right. So Gamora's yawning. Chris Pratt's rubbing his nose. Rocket's scratching his balls. Yep, so I mean, here comes the big battle. We're an hour twenty-two in, and we got almost a half hour of this battle. And uh, you know, I'm gonna do play-by-play, -play, but not necessarily about just the action, but my feeling about it. John C. Riley's not even dressed. They make him the commander later. Okay, and they're right there. There's the beautiful short brunette. And Infinity Stone. Right, we have Glenn Close and John C. Riley. Talking about Ronin and the Infinity Stones. All right, you going? Okay, John C. Riley, he's doing okay here. A hole, <laughs> but he's not. And I'm quoting him here. One hundred percent attack. I should, yeah. I don't know if I believe anyone's one hundred percent attack. Uh, this look. John C. Riley in the music. Yeah, I believe him. Yep. And they sell it because he makes fun of Star Prince, as he calls him at the beginning. You know, he's running him down, and he goes, Ah, oh, it's okay to have a code name, man. It, it's That's cool. God, she's such a badass. All right, so Lean Pace is running. I've established that. We've got Glenn Close as the leader of this part of the galaxy. This is an awesome idea. Now, why they can't continue to shoot fireballs, I don't know. Like some of the Star Wars prequels battles, the logic is not quite there the way it was in the original trilogy. Oh, here it is. Boom. Diving below with the full Guardians music. That's the thing. The Guardians hook is complex enough, but short enough to play over and over again. And it always surprises you. Boom. I love this shot. See, this is the dynamic movement I wish they had more of. Right? It's a lot of close-ups on the pilot. 
Right? They're beneath us. We never would have thought they'd be beneath us. So you got three, you got all these ships from Ronin. You know, three Ravager ships shooting out the cargo bay, whatever. So, you know, it's a lot of chaos. And I'm cool with it. I love, I, I, you know, I love the fireworks show. Oh, this is cool. The way they control the propulsion with that uh, CGI orb. Karen Gillan, I'm sorry, is Nebula. Can't wait for her and Gamora in a second. Boom. All right. So, you know, they picked the two top pilots to go on this suicide run. They have to take Yondu out. You know, it's a green screen, into the cockpit, from behind. There's enough going on, it stays super interesting. But, you know, there's head-on. I mean, everything is front, back, side, side, into the cockpit, out of the cockpit. Not everything, but, you know, right here, more of this, more of this dynamic movement. Boom, got clipped on the wing. That looked great. You look at Karen Gillan on IMDb, she's so beautiful, but it's, you can barely recognize her. She looks like Jennifer Lawrence. All right, here we go. This gave me chills. I did not see this coming. You're going, okay, here come the cavalry from Xandar. They look like the canary ships, but way better. I love this guy. They had to sell this guy in a very short time. You got my dick message. <laughs> Right, prove me wrong. That's like uh, Christopher Pike to to uh, Jim Kirk saying, "I dare you to do better." Uh, this is great. Uh, yeah, see, that's the thing. I keep loving Drax more as it goes on, and so the early stuff just works for me on repeat viewings. He's just laughing. They're killing, uh, you know, hundreds of soldiers. Drax is just laughing his ass off. You know, again, Peter Quill, all guns. Yes. He must have really been excited. <laughs> oh, she's so cute. We're just like Kevin Bacon. That's the thing. She has such a hard exterior, but she also has a naivete that Ahura doesn't have. Here we go. Clota, clota. Clota, clota. She's such a badass. Get out of my way. The way Karen Gillan walks is just ridiculous. I mean, it's, it, you know... It's so intense and authoritative, and yet still sexy. And, and I, I think I should have explained this earlier. Okay, speaking of sexy, you're trying to look at Glenn Close. I'm sorry, Glenn Close. You're a great actress. But this, the, the hair, it's not just the woman. I mean, you got to look at her hair. We'll see her again. She's just tapping buttons, doing nothing. Were they just like, people aren't going to want to look at Glenn Close? I mean, she's not, you know, ugly. But she's not Meryl Streep in terms of older ladies. I mean, Meryl Streep's still kind of sexy. I think. Mostly because of her personality and her acting. But, I, dude, I did not see the net coming. And even though this fails, I suppose it buys enough time. But the ship... And that's my complaint. There's this huge thing to stop the ship. It's a brilliant plan. Create a net around it, knowing that you're probably all going to die. But what do they think they're going to do? It's just too much for us. And then they still hit the ground. They don't kill Ronin. Groot dies. They still hit the ground. But sometimes you gotta do that. It's like Empire Strikes Back. You gotta lose some battles before you win them. So this is the fantasy stuff. You know? It's the magical stuff. Kind of cheesy New Age music, but the imagery is so great. And they're so mystified. And, uh, you know, this is where you see all of these hardened criminals, cynical individuals. You know, truly uh, mystified and enjo- briefly enjoying this miracle of creation that is Groot. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Even over the top actor, you give him even more over the top line. Yeah, Quill, you are my friend. This dumb tree, he is my friend. 
the screen or yeah they're great together boom the robotic way this this chick moves look at her the way she's holding the knives karen gillen killing it as nebula right right he called her a whore and now she's his friend and that's the thing he didn't see the whore combat as a as a uh insult you know he just thinks that's what she is oh, his toys uh, that's character building right there. You don't need the toy stuff, but it's it's the one childlike thing about this guy. So this is a scene that's so unrealistic, and that is actually what makes it great. Look at that shot. I mean, that's the thing. The practical makeup, even though they all look blue, is so convincing. And these guys, I mean, it's a thing. The bad guys in all these movies, they all look like Chitari, you know. Right, he takes out the ship. You know, you're going, oh, this is a brilliant plan. Brilliant plan. Catches it. Perfect CGI. And then you got to make the ship crash. Boom. And explode. Oh, it's classic. <laughs> this just looks great. Yeah, I think that my only real problem is the Ravager ships. They just... There's a few moments of of dynamic camera stuff in space. Look at this. Oh, the way her face snaps back. I have no idea how they did that. I think they had her move her lips as much into that position as possible and then overlaid CGI. Right. These guys fight with swords and knives. Right. So she's stunning Gamora instead of skewering her. This movie's just a lot of fun. I could really watch it, you know, like once a month. But, um, while it does have a great heart, it doesn't have the the narrative oomph, for me, of Serenity in the Star Trek reboot. In terms of sci-fi movies, for me. All-time great uh, sci-fi movies, like space operas. The original trilogy, and then Serenity and Star Trek Reboot are neck and neck, and then this is very close. Right, right here. I mean, that's the thing. You do the quote-unquote green screen shot. (laughs) I'm taking orders from a hamster. They're still insulting him, but the fact that he says, I'm taking orders. (laughs) Yes, Star-Lord, finally. The fact that he agrees to take orders from this hamster says all you need to know. They respect him. And that's what Rocket learns. Everyone learns. Rocket learns that people can make jokes about him and and still like him or have respect for him. Oh, this is one of the great gratuitous death scenes ever because it's great. It'll be interesting to see if they start really calling him Star-Lord or just keep up the joke going forward. God, Guardians 2, I cannot wait for. I mean, it has to set up a lot of shit, but I think it'll live up to it. James Gunn is just brilliant. I follow him online. He's so active. He's friends and in communication with all the Marvel people, directors, writers, producers, actors. Everyone loves him. He loves everyone. He's like Joss in that way. Perfect Marvel guy. Team player. Has his own vision. They thought he was crazy, but he's so brilliant. They let him do this. Made $750 million. Even beat Captain America, the Winter Soldier, worldwide, slightly. And X-Men, Days of Future Past. Right, so here's the Star-Lord. Boom, guns, guns, guns. It's great visual, but he's such a built dude. You know, if he was like a smaller or slighter guy. But I just want to see him kick some butt. I guess he does with... uh, Oh no, it's it's Drax. Look at this. Finger to the throat means death. Right, no one, everyone's trying to start using Peter Quill's metaphors, earthly metaphors, right? Yeah, sort of. Had nothing to do with finger to the throat. Here we go. Totally gratuitous. Okay, so this first group, they're dead immediately. The second group's just standing there in shock. And so, everyone's dead. I mean, the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> and here it comes the Groot smile. Eh, I did good. I did good. That's it. I mean, you know, Groot doesn't love killing people, but if it's helping his friends in a good cause, yeah. Uh-huh. 
then this was great. I love this. I'm always saying there's not enough death. And this is exactly the right amount of death, but also the right way to do it. You kill all of these pilots. There's too many beyond, you know, compare to to even know how many. It's like hundreds at least. But we've met enough, right? And the Ravagers get killed, and Saul, and all, and Tyler Perry, and all the pilots we've gotten to know. Oh, this is this is awesome. And in this last breath, he's calling for Rocket to help. They're all fighting together. I mean, this comic books. People don't like each other, hate each other, make fun of each other, but shit hits the fan. Oh, man. And this is the thing that saves the space battle for me. I might have criticized this, but watching it now, I love the weird, twisting, almost prehistoric look of Ronin's ship. And this is like with the X-Wings and the Star Destroyers. You don't need to use colors other than various shades of gray. If the textures and attachments and pawns and the bridge and the hangar bay and all the parts of giant capital ships. Yeah, still electrocuted, Gamora. Now she's about to pull her move. Uh, the skull, it looks great. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, when Gamora finally gets a clean kick, boom, right up the side. This is an interesting exchange. Right. Now she wants to save her. Trying to turn her. I know you're both crazy. That may have been true about the old Gamora, but that was the... <laughs> Get out. I love it. With one hand, she jumps out of Ravager ship and throws the guy out, takes the ship. But the Gamora now it, it, it is not crazy. I mean, she'll do crazy stuff. Oh, now she's using the guns. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, they just let Zoe totally kick ass. I love this shot. Look at this. Boom, head on, right, straight on, back and forth, 90 degrees, slow motion. They use super fast photography to make this happen. And, you know, I mean, even if you're not looking at your watch, you got to be thinking this isn't going to kill Ronan. Not with the Infinity Stone. But what's great is, after teasing, yeah, and they know how to tease weapons. You know, we, there was a tease of Yondu's uh, killer arrow a few times before he really uses it. Hey, John Enforcer, they teased it before with Rocket, making his threat against the Ravager ship. And then they tease it here, almost killing Ronin, or apparently killing Ronin. Right. Drex goes back for more, and they finally figure out how to use the Hadron Enforcer. Okay, so this never made total sense to me. You know, Rocket's just enraged at this whole situation now. You know, somehow they sold a bond between him and Saul, <gasps> just because of the acting and the performances. And so he crashes in, he almost kills all of his friends including Drax, it's not clear where Ronan goes, and, and Drax is, you know, knocked out but alive, and this causes the ship to crash, which is the last thing they wanted. You know, who cares? Because We Are Groot is coming up, and uh, it's a beautiful moment. So, like, this movie feels like an absolutely brilliant, realized sci-fi comic book movie. Really, an A-plus sci-fi comic book movie. But it doesn't achieve transcendence, to me, the way the Avengers movies do. But, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint, I do like my sci-fi, you know, both futuristic and old school at the same time. And, uh... You know, Abrams, Whedon, and Lucas knew how to do that. That's not what Gunn was going for. He's going for crazy far future, where things look fantastical, but all seem to make sense, scientifically, I suppose. Yeah, this is way over the top, but we've had so many comedic, you know, or I should say, we've had so many dramatic misdirects, which look like it's going to end in a totally cheesy scene, and then we get standing around like a bunch of a-holes, or... Peter Quill, you know, bragging about his heroism. You needed this. And 
the realization that Groot's going to sacrifice himself and he's taking care of everybody. I mean, the thing is, is, you know, (laughs) Vin Diesel didn't have to do much for this movie, but it didn't mean he didn't try hard. His performance is great. They did model his face a little bit, I believe, in terms of his lips and eyes. I could be wrong. They don't actually show the death. They just show the crash. Awesome. And this crash is what sells Xandar. Because it was just so shiny, episode one looking. And now, boom, took out half the city. And the sacrifice. I mean, when, when Rocket picks up a piece of Groot, like a stick, and starts crying, and Drax rubs his back. You know, this movie pulled that off. You have a weird giant blue slash red alien who's a total psycho, you know, bent on revenge, who talks weird and doesn't get, you know, metaphorical jokes, and a a cybernetic raccoon, we don't even know where he came from, who's also psychotic (laughs) and gets great joy out of machine gunning bad guys. And they have this tender moment that is a bromance moment, you know? I mean, it's really a tender scene between two characters, two male characters that, that is just brother and brother. Don't have to say anything. Oh my God, look at Zoe with the hair. Oh, this is great. Ronan comes out. And this is, I love this. And this is this is the first time Rocket has done. Well, maybe crashing the jet was irrational. What does he think he's going to accomplish here? It he doesn't even think. He doesn't even think that he's going to he's going to get his ass kicked. He just wants revenge. Right? He had to say Guardians of the Galaxy. Get biblical language. What fruit have they wrought? So I guess the mirror are that the mirror here is that Drax is irrational about revenge for his family. And Ronan is irrational about revenge for his family. But, you know, oh, renounce your paltry gods. But Drax turns and Ronan doesn't. So, this is the most controversial part of the movie. I fucking love this. I fucking love this. And the nerds I listened to were very split on this. But it is so brilliantly executed by Pratt with this horrible dance. And the thing is, Pratt can sing really well, so he has to actually act like he's only an 80% good singer. Yeah, break it down. And, you know, as Sean and some of the guys commented it, as Sean and some of the guys commented on this, this would be the one thing to distract Ronan. Because he has really no comprehension of not only what's going on, what dancing is, but that a person could ever feel or act this way. Oh, that's great. They go, nope, we're going for the Infinity Stone. You know, did they They must have maybe planned this on their way down. We don't see when Groot's protecting them before they crash. Okay, so from here until the end of the movie is one of my favorite five, six-minute scenes. You know, super high drama, special effects, character built. I mean, they're just screaming, but the way these people come together in this moment... It's just great. So this is a track called Black Tears. I listen to this all the time. They work so hard to get this to the Guardians theme, but they go so dark. You see the purple and black cloud, but people outside can't see it. Everything's spinning around. This is amazing. And this is the go full fantasy and just make it look awesome. Take my hand. Do they know that they're sharing the, the power of the stone? Oh, I got chills. I have chills. Mom's back. Take my hand. He didn't take his mom's hand. He he didn't take his mom's hand. Now he's going to take Gamora. He's thinking about his mom. And, you know, this is the electric slide thing or whatever you call it. (laughs) You know, but... uh, It's so over the top. Here is the music. So this is the super long swell where you 
keep thinking they're going to swell, but then they keep transposing into different keys, or modulating, I should say. And another modulation up to a higher register here. With each character, it goes higher. Here it comes. Oh, music right now. What a shot. You're mortal. Oh, listen to music. Say it yourself, bitch. Oh, here's the theme music. <laughs> but they're building it up to the highest ever. The energy beam. That, oh, man, the power stone tearing them apart. And Zoe immediately. Boom. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's the thing. Gamora's dealing with all this shit. She's the first one to take his hand. And that's... Okay. So this look here is so brilliant. They're attracted to each other, but it's not like I want to jump on you right now. They're still assessing it. The nookie nookie. Yeah. It's a misdirect. I'm telling you. There's no way these two end up together. This is not um, Thor and Jane Foster. These two work better as, uh, you know, flirty, argumentative, sarcastic teammates. Right? And because we saw the full power of the arrow, we don't even have to see it leave his belt. He's doing the switch. And so, you know, it's been much talked about. Does Yandu know? Look at that smile. He doesn't even look at the orb. Tells his guys to go. I don't think Yandu thinks that's the orb. And so Quill should actually not say anything here because he's overselling it. But watch Yandu's response. Don't open it. What does Yandu do? Points at him. Says, yep, I know what you're saying. And when he opens it later, I mean, it's a true it's a true grin and laugh when he sees the, tr- the troll. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Uh, right, here's the tease. It's dead. <laughs> So, a lot of speculation about Peter Quill's dad. I don't care enough about the comics. There's Jason of Spartax. There's Starhawk, Star Fox. It's all sorts of crazy shit. He's going to kill you. Yeah, he's not. They're going to work together. They have to. They'll probably be at odds at the beginning. They're, that's the thing. With this Thanos threat is getting so big, they're going to need all hands on deck. I guarantee we see John C. Riley again and his whole crew. I mean, that's the whole thing. You know, they're starting to hide all the Infinity Stones, but because of the gauntlet, Thanos needs all six, so he's going to have to come to Xandar, break in, and, you know, Xandar now has the Power Stone in the orb. The Collector, although he lost the orb, still has the ether from the end of Thor the Dark World, which is the Red Stone. Oh, God, this is so touching. I mean, for Bradley Cooper to... Make the noises of a raccoon up and right there. And if you know animals and they're a little upset and you just pet them gently on the head, that's the exact response. And he knows because Drax can't tell a lie, can't, you know, be disingenuous that it's coming from a good place despite their hatred for each other. I'm not Darren. Right, so they're teasing. The, <laughs> there's the pretty girl on the left. It's pretty ridiculous. Tapping on. I mean, she's not. She. You know what? She looks like a young. Um, what's her fucking name? From from Wild Things. Such a bad actress. Denarian day, and this guy's in charge. Look at that belly. <laughs> he gives him a little gag side. Oh man, Denarian day gives uh gives the prez a little gag side. Okay, here it is. More Thanos setting up. Uh, the, the prediction is that Drax is going to die, being one of the guys who tries to kill. I mean, I think Drax, the Vision. I'm starting to come up with a list of characters who I think will be dead by the end of 2019. I think Drax is one. Yeah, it looks good. I just don't love the color scheme. That's it. That's it. You know, looking back on it, I even like their cheesy outfits that look like they're from the uh, 
with the three glowing dots. It looks like it's from the fifth element, but I like the fifth element system. We missed all that in the action, but you know he's got the red wife and daughter, and 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 actually Rocket saves them. <laughs> He'll be arrested. What if I want it more than the person? Still illegal. <laughs> right, Zoe's smiling. She's taking Rocket's hand. God, she's so sweet. And <laughs> decide to remove his spine. This is the best delivery right here. I die. <laughs> it's one of the worst crimes of all. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> also illegal. <laughs> mm. <gasps> oh. Yeah, you got to bring back John C. Riley. These guys have great vibe. Right, and they keep the little earpiece behind Quell for his uh, face mask. It's great. And this is it. This is it. It started with great emotion having to do with his mom and his past. He hasn't opened it all these years. I mean, it's touching just seeing it in there that he's never done it. It's been, you know, 20 years or something. Right, and here's where we get the Star-Lord reveal, which is obvious looking back, but makes so much sense. You know, I, I loved running around in, like, my He-Man and Star Wars outfits growing up, and, you know... I'm not sure I got to the point where my mom would like actually call me the name of the characters, but it's the same thing. You got to support your little boy in their imagination. Star-Lord, he reads it. Love, Mom. Yep. Andy Dwyer knows what he's doing here. This isn't Parks and Recreation. This is Guardians of the fucking Galaxy. This movie probably made more money than the entire run of Parks and Rec, and I love that show. Especially with merchandising. Oh my god, the rocket and Groot fingers. Right, also makes volume two. They're calling Guardians 2. Guardians of the Galaxy volume two. Brilliant idea. We can't wait for the soundtrack. Such an awesome device. You know, this should have been destroyed in the crash. Oh, here's the crying. That's real crying, I think. I don't think that's eye drops. I could be wrong. It's convincing. You don't need to... Here we go. This is it. The whole movie is leading to this. This hard... Asked killer. All of a sudden, she's smiling, doing a little dance, feeling the soul music. Oh, God. Zoe Saldana. I mean, you know, eating star fruit and doing a little head bob to the soul music. She's so fabulous. The thing is, Zoe's so real. She's so open and honest on her Facebook feed. The only thing she doesn't do, she shows pictures of her kids, but not their faces, which I totally get. Her husband, her friends, videos of her dancing. I mean, perky Zoe in the in these various movies, that's her. But, you know, she's so talented that she can play many different modified versions right and here's where we learn that the red people that rocket saved during the battle are his family great spinning shot immediately by this chemistry despite the absurdity of the red gomorrah's green is the best skin color change ever by far all right okay so we miss zoe patting drax very intimately on the shoulder they're coming together. Groot's coming back. Rocket's got his smile back. Rocket smiles with his eyes. It's so hard to pull off with CGI. They were able to do that with Gollum during the few moments. Star-Lord. I mean, that is a direct, you know, she's constantly sarcastically referring to Kirk as Captain, even though he is Captain. Hope you know what you're doing, Captain. Oh, man. Great movie. Great movie. I had a blast. I had a blast, honestly. Um, I don't know if this was my most compelling uh, uh, commentary because, you know, like I said, my boys did a whole bunch of three-hour podcasts, including commentary on this that I love. And I don't want to repeat it. In fact, I'll, I'm going to plug it, you know. It's different than mine. Um, and, and there's like three of them doing commentary. It's great. So just go to modernmythmedia.com or just Google Modern Myth Media Guardians of the Galaxy audio commentary. It's fantastic. 
And unlike th- them, I have not seen the James Gunn commentary, though I'm dying to. They say it's one of the best ever. Yeah, the Michael Jackson, Jackson 5 dancing. I mean, how can, how can this not make you smile? This song, Mini Groot. So apparently James Gunn had a very specific vision for how he wanted um, he wanted Mini Groot to dance, but he was too embarrassed. And so he went into a room by himself, and they had a camera, and he just went to town. And probably only a few people saw it at the, the effects team and turned it into grit. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, this is a work of love. Both guns, actors, crew, everyone was on board for this movie. We needed this movie. We needed a feel-good space opera. I mean, you had Serenity in 05, Star Trek in 09. And really, since then, this is the first one. Here's the theme. Sorry for all the singing. I might cut some of this out. And what's great is, you know, like they keep finding ways with the theme to leave it unresolved and move into more, you know, like heavy stuff and then just ease it off. Tyler Bates, I mean, to put in such an incredible soundtrack of classic American pop songs and still write, a, you know, a score that gives you chills at all the right moments. Really great job. No criticism about this movie. I mean, it's pretty close to Winter Soldier. I just, after all of these huge Marvel movies, even though it was very epic as it went along, the fact that it was Cap and Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson, and Chris Evans, it was a quote unquote smaller movie because there's like five, you know, lead or semi lead good guys and a handful of lead bad guys. And so that human drama, despite all the action, got to play out. I think, you know, it's like. <laughs> I could watch The Avengers all day, but sometimes I just need some, you know, minimalist you know, high art and from a filmmaking standpoint that just is, it is flawless. And Captain America is one of those movies. This is not, but it does not make it less great. It makes it more great. I love the chaos. I do. I love it. And from everything I've been hearing from James Gunn, who is not afraid to talk about non-spoilery stuff that's going to be going on in the future... He's so pumped. He was so pumped for this movie. You can just tell the enthusiasm. And when you've got guys like Gunn and the Russo brothers and Whedon and Abrams, I mean, these people just know how to inspire the hundreds or thousands of people involved in these things. They just have that vision. They really do. And it's becoming more and more common for these directors, these all-star, top-notch directors of these epic movies to write. I mean, Whedon's always, you know, Whedon's always written everything that he's directed. He, that's how he rolls. J.J. written some. Others just directed. Wrote and direct Star Wars. Gun wrote and direct this. It's true love. It is. I mean, this is what Marvel's done so great. It's not just the quality. It's the buy-in of, the, of everyone from the directors to the cast to the crew to embrace the absurdity. But... You know, I mean, the the real human drama and excitement of these movies. So kudos, Guardians of the Galaxy. Don't know when I'll release this. Have a ton of Star Wars stuff coming up. But I'm still loving this music. I paid for this soundtrack. I mean, I always pay, but I definitely paid for this one. (laughs) The fully official way I paid for this one. I wanted it. There might have been some bonus tracks. Uh, But, oh, yeah. Dude, if you just get one track... Go to iTunes, Black Tears. It's the music when when they're, you know, in the purple spinning energy cloud with Ronan and joining hands. And it is just glorious. It's glorious. This movie's great. Hope you enjoyed it. Great performance by Pratt. Love Zoe. I, she can say or do anything. I, I never thought Dave Bautista would work for me, but he really just keeps pushing it as the movie goes along. You know, I, 
Batista just embraces the lunacy of the whole thing, and Rocket really is a lunatic. It, it, it almost helps that he it, he's voiced by Bradley Cooper in a studio who can just go totally over the top because you can go over the top with the with the voice and then tone it down slightly by subtle facial gestures. So. <laughs> Okay, that's the last time I'll sing it, and uh, Bizzle out.